Hi, I'm Neil McCormick. Welcome to Needle Time at Abbey Road, where I'm thrilled to have as my guest the great English singer-songwriter and blues guitarist, and a lot of other things besides, which we're about to discuss, Chris Rea. Hi, oh, it's great to be here. <laughs> well, you brought us here, Chris. Yeah. Um, to discuss amongst, let's start with this, um, this, we call this a coffee table book, so we've brought in a coffee table just to put it on. Your passion, La Passione. This is an album that you recorded in 96. Yeah. Uh, but you have spent some time getting it together the way you would like it, mm -hmm. some nearly 20 years later. So uh, let's, let's, let's tell us about that, first of all. Um, it was an unusual album for you in the first place because, you know, we know you as a singer songwriter and a blues guitarist. This is a big orchestral uh, Brought out piece. the absolute perfect week, the birth of Brit rock. <laughs> <laughs> Just went boom. <laughs> It, it's, it's obviously been a lifelong um, passion. It's about your obsession, am I right? With, I would say passion. Yeah, with um, a German motor driver, a motoring uh, champion, mm -hmm. and, and what happened to him. So, so tell us, first of all, about the origins of La Passione. Um, well, the origins of the, the actual La Passione, inverted commas, DD, DVD, was I was with the head of Warner Brothers and we'd reached that point where we'd brought out our first best of. Okay. And you know, when you've been in the game as long as you have, you know what's coming next and it's actually a bit vacuous and a dark and stormy night, you know. Right, the long decline. So I needed to go somewhere else. You know, I accepted, I was getting older and a lot of guys were having trouble with that. I wasn't, I always knew well, I was old when I came in, so it didn't seem so bad for me. But I said, I'd like to make Warner Brothers' first DVD. So you can watch while well, I've always, this is my obsession more than the Passione is, moving forward in ways of listening to music. Because the, the rock and roll pop canvas is a very small canvas. And we could take it in other places like the old album bands did when I first got interested in the 70s. So he said, yeah, off you go. Uh, gave me a limited budget, um, which we were going to recoup off uh, dodgy film time in the middle of the night. You know, people, that's how people end up paying for films. Is, you know, it's on in Spain at two o'clock in the morning or something, and that's where you get your money back. Um, we did a little piece about the little boy, which it does come from me, you know, I'm Irish Italian, therefore definitely Catholic. And you daydream in church. And that was the whole nut of where it all came from. I remember daydreaming in church a lot because we didn't understand what the priest was talking about anyway. Um, and he, he imagines that Enzo Ferrari takes the place of the priest and he, at the end of his imagination getting carried away he's got a shark nose Dino Ferrari on the altar you know, in his head and the British Film Institute came to have a look uh, and this bit was probably one of the nicer bits of what was happening and they said oh well, maybe we should put this up for a newcomer, they thought it was all going to be like that. And then Warner's and a lot of executives across the huge Warner Corporation suddenly woke up. Suddenly I wasn't the only man stood near a camera. I had about 84 lawyers. I mean, the lawyers from America were just so funny trying to deal with this thing called a Ferrari. You know, you got this. Jewish girl who's head of legal in Warner Brothers and you're trying to tell her why you can't do a 34 page contract sheet because Ferrari have let you go there. She said well I need it. Lots of things like that happened all the time and in the end I just I don't even remember. It's like your first album when you're with a world famous producer. You don't actually remember the end of it. You're just absolutely drained. 
And that's what happened with Pasquale. So they got away from you? Oh, absolutely. And Big time. In quite an un uh, uh, so it became an unhappy experience. Right. You'd made a lot of great music for it, orchestral music. And, and, and that was the main reason. Yeah, a different style of performing for you and thing, but also it's drawing on. It is drawing. I'd, I'd like to ask you first of all about the, about this uh, the character of the driver. W were you who is a German driver? What was his name? Wolfgang Grafenberger von Trips. Yeah, I wanted you to say that. Not me. I, I missed the Ag Ag Alexander out as well. Who died in a car crash, a terrible car crash, when he w could have won the. The, the Grand Prix, mm. uh, become world champion. He died in a terrible car crash in 1961 that killed a lot of other people as well, yeah. tw 20 uh, onlookers. But did that, had that always stayed with you? Did that strike you then, or is this yeah. something that you don't, right? So. Yeah, it, that was, you know, the, the thing about La Passione, it's not so much for peril heads as me trying to fathom out why it's, it's not actually peril head. It's, there is a passion there. There is a, a spiritual thing about those red cars. You know, I see now people make better cars, but the journalist always goes off and buys a Ferrari. <laughs> you know, it's that. There's something about it, and I'm trying to put my finger on it. Everything about Italy with second generation Italians is bigger than it really is. You know, my grandfather was 100% Italian and he ran away from the place because it was completely different living there. But my dad would have lots of things like the sun is shining from Rome and it's going around the world, but Rome is the center of the cosmos, you know. And I'm sat there on a Sunday afternoon, steel town, everything's black and white. And there's this thing on the television, and it's uh, BBC, Monaco Grand Prix, and they only had static cameras in those days. So a car would whoosh by. So the guy would be saying, um, and there's Sterling Moss, you know, it was his greatest ever drive this day. And he's holding off the shark nose Ferraris, you know. And you could just see them in the distance. You never got to see them close up. And I said, Dad, you know, what's the shark nose Ferrari? He says, son, these are the most powerful engine in the world. The most, you know, you have to be an absolute, oh, somewhere, someone out of Blade Runner to be able to drive them, you know. And they've got shark noses and they're much more powerful. So I said, who's the, he said, the top driver is a, a German count. He lives in a castle in Cologne and he drives over the Alps to race Ferraris. I mean, it's like LST, you know, <laughs> he goes, what? He did that, you know. And they were always coming and coming all afternoon and it just, that day, I completely changed. You know, that was, that was my first LST trip. Um, I went out into the black and white, into the church, and for Sunday school and all that. And all my brain was thinking of was Wolfgang von Trips. And it passed, you know, it's all, you get your long trousers and you move into life. And then we cut to 93, we was playing at the sports stadium in Cologne and we got two days off because you have to put all the rigging up and all that. I'm wandering around and I see this little house and I look on the, the thing and it says the Wolfgang von Tripp's museum and it's this whole rush happened, you know. Oh yeah, he was from around here. But they took me in, they showed me all of his furniture. He was a real like an early stylist, you know, he was, he had a 16 mil camera, which is huge in 1959, you know. So they said, would you like to see these? And I said, what are they? And they said, well, they're all Wolfgang's films from when he used to go racing. It's never, ever been seen before. Things like Fanjo and Sterling Moss having an ice cream fight in Casablanca behind the pits and stuff like that. 
Um, I was absolutely blown away that I think mainly because no one had ever seen this stuff before. It was like some kind of magical cave, you know, and you, Alice in Wonderland. And they said, make a film for Wolfgang, and they gave me the film. I couldn't believe it. So we brought it back and started making La Passione, which gave me an excuse to write orchestra music. Neil McCormick and you're watching Needle Time where we are discussing the passion of Chris Rea. The passion for cars, the passion for painting, because these are your paintings mm -hmm. of cars and of the symbology of, that's come out of this, and a uh, passion for film, which, was, which, which originated in this period, but also a passion for music. When did music become your central thing? <sighs> 1970, uh, 1973. That's pretty late. On yeah. all the local bands in Middlesbrough, I've sometimes seen them over the years now, and they say, "You never told us, Chris." You know, I used to have the ice cream van, my dad's ice cream van. I used to take the amplifiers to the working men's club gigs, and I never thought once of being a rock star or a pop singer or whatever until I heard a guy called Charlie Patton. Accidentally, I was in my mum's bedroom Saturday. I'm trying to do the back of my hair and she's got those old 50s, see behind your mirrors. She also has an alarm clock where the radio comes on. It comes on and it was just at the beginning of live satellite broadcasts on Saturdays when the satellite was in the sky at the right place from America. And it was somewhere in a place called Memphis and it was this hazy hazy sound and I could hear this voice and it was actually like my voice because I, I, I don't have a voice I'd love to have it's, it's deep, it's difficult it fills up the mix stops the drums coming through all that kind of thing but I heard this guy sounded a bit like he could be my uncle or and I heard this sound, and that's what gave me the shivers. So on that night, I said to a bass player in one of the local bands, what's that sound that this guy would? He said, I thought it was a violin. And he said, no, you get a, a bottleneck or sometimes a pen knife, and you take it up and you don't play the frets. So two days later, I was a proud owner of a Hofner guitar they didn't have any bottlenecks in the music shops in Middlesbrough, so I used one of my older sisters had a perfect bottle that was nail varnish, and it was metallic pink from Boots. And that became my slide for about a year. So you were about 21? 21, 22, Yeah, so, it's, so it is late, to, very late to pick up an instrument and to pick up a, a, an obsession. Were you... It sounds as if you were just waiting for a trigger for your creativity. Sliding door wise, yeah. Yeah, and and uh, were you a quick learner then? Uh, not that quick. I would, what kind of technically held me up was I only wanted to know about slide. So I never had that um, six, seven years of a teenager sitting in his bedroom, ruthlessly learning scales. You know, I mean, Clapton never ceases, never ceases to impress me, no matter what people say about him his accuracy and his power of all of the blue scales is, is devastating, even to this day, you know. Um, so I didn't have any of that. Uh, I started, as I got into the business, of getting another guitar to play, proper guitar. But it was, I was always behind, a long, long way behind, you know. But then you must have quite quickly developed something else, which was the writing and the singing. Yeah, if, if someone said you can have your life again, I'd have gone to classical uh, writing. That's what I would have done as a young person. And in my dream of dreams, I'd have been a film, uh, film musician. That's what I would have been. I still wanted to be that, but this voice got in the way. And execs just wanted the voice. But they never said, here, go and do that then. 
they're terribly slimy, you know. <laughs> There's, there isn't another word for it because I've got a quarter of a century of people lying to me, you know, and things you hear on the radio and you go, I didn't even, they didn't even ask me if that was going on, you know. So I spent a good 10 years really, I didn't do the Ford Transit, you know, I've often said to young lads, you've got to do your Ford Transit. It's part of, it's like doing your A levels. Well, I never got the Ford Transit. I got the record executive 10 years later, you know. Mm. My first record, I was put with an Elton John. Pete Waterman actually got the sack over me because we came up with the idea of Bill Simzik, Joe Walsh's producer, Willie Weeks and Andy Newmark and Richard T. And they wouldn't have anything about this. And the head of Magna Records in, in the end got rid of Waterman because he, he bless him, he stood up for me. Uh, but we ended up with Elton John's producer. And the first thing that happened with that kind of thing in those days was your local band that you brought with you disappear. I mean, thankfully, the band anyway won the Melody Maker rock contest. So they went off to EMI with the Melody Maker and um, I'm stood on my own. What was the band called? The Beautiful Losers. The Beautiful Losers, OK. So you were stood on Which your Which my record company thought was just the most ridiculously That's negative a... band, you know. <laughs> That's a great name. It's from a Leonard Cohen. Yeah. Um, that's where I was at mentally. And you recorded Fool If You Think It's Over. You winced when I said that. Yeah, it I'm is a beautiful song. Well, I've still got the piece of paper at home. It's in a frame. And it says, Fool If You Think It's Over, 96 beats per minute, Song for Al Green, Al Jackson drums. And that's exactly all it was meant to be. We tried to get it over there, but I was without help completely. But I didn't know I was out without help. You know, sometimes this gets in the way because I don't give up. You know, maybe I should have walked. You know, people like uh, Tom Petty and stuff, they walked it when this kind of thing started happening to them. I was from Middlesbrough and I was trying to pay the bills, you know, and that became more important. I was derailed by having a massive kind of easy listening type of hit. Oh, without a doubt. It's still there now. I still know journalists who won't give me the time of day because of that song. But you, you, you kind of, your mid-period recovery then <laughs> is to get into what you always loved, which is the blues, which is, is kind of driving through, through your music since then? Well, that was only caused, wasn't caused by wisdom. I'd be a real liar if I said it was wisdom. It was caused by a dreadful illness, you know, which I still have, but it meant a 15-hour operation, eight weeks in hospital, and over a year in recoup. And I went down to Eight Stone, um, and I'm, my poor wife was trying, because she knows what this is like. I mean, it really is a, it's a condition, it's not talent. Creativity is a condition. And when you have to deal with it under medical circumstances, you find out it's not a gift, it's, it's a condition. You have to deal with it somehow. And she was giving me little jobs every day. And so she gave me that job of the bedroom cupboard where it's full of crap and there's even a cufflink, just one, not two, and yet you can't ever remember ever putting a cufflink on, you know, that kind of cupboard. And at the bottom of that cupboard was a Charlie Patton and Sister Rosetta Tharp, and I burst into tears, you know, and I thought, Jesus, I've come through Vietnam, metaphorically, um, and there it is. That was my first, the first record I bought. And I haven't seen it for 20 years. And my wife was dying to get me motivated and on my feet. She said, well, why don't you go into the studio and just do that? Because they, do, they won't want it anyway. So there's nothing, you don't have to worry about executives and paying the bills. And so I did. And it was called Stony Road and completely different career now. It's weird. <laughs> 
I'm Neil McCormick, and you're watching Needle Time with my guest, Chris Rea. So, um, so you got the blues, you got ill, you got the blues, you recovered your musical mojo. Um, uh, you know, in the light of, of, of La Passione and, and uh, you know, thinking about your, um, your musical career, it does seem strange that, that, that you're now probably better known and best known for a song about being stuck in a traffic jam. <laughs> Slightly ironic for a man who loves racing cars. You want the story of that yeah, night? Yeah, give us the story of... Uh, it's absolute... There is, they're going to put a plaque there. <laughs> Aren't they really? It's the M4 where you turn off to go on the M25. We are coming out of London. Uh, the driver had a mobile phone, one of them like that, and I, I didn't have a mobile phone. So he, he, John had phoned him and said, you know, what time will you be back for dinner, all that kind of stuff. And I said, well, don't put Josie in the bath. I'll be back the way the crow flies, 20 minutes time. Four and a half hours we were still there. And we'd ran out of cigarettes, that's what I always remember. We were now sharing cigarettes and complaining that someone took three drags instead of two. <laughs> you go out to have a wee, and the blue lights come flying up and stay in your car, you know. And it became like, uh, like a Blade Runner thing. And I suddenly realised that week, as I'm one, we'd moved down south, we'd become successful. But I didn't see anyone smiling at all. And it was kind of premonition as to what it has become, you know. Uh, the curse of money. The people are just in traffic jams for three hours on a morning, three hours on a night, just to pay for the food for the fam and the mortgage. And it came out of me in that car. They're always the better songs when you actually sing something you're thinking. So you don't do a tune and then think of the words. It just comes out together. And it was an old gospel thing, you know what I mean? Stood still on a highway, I saw a woman by the side of the road. That is pure gospel spirit, you know. I mean, maybe someone might phone up and say, I wrote that to you. <laughs> Somebody who now lives in Memphis or something. So you were in your car writing this song, singing it out. Yeah. By the time you, you got home, you were on the road from hell to, uh, to, to the pop charts. I was a changed man. Well, no, they didn't want to put it out. They did, really? No, no. God, blimey. Uh, we call it the Rue d'Enfer incident. <laughs> because they had another band that had, had a huge hit, ACDC, with the were Highway to Hell. I didn't know that, but they were trying to coax me. This is exactly what happens with big record companies. And they were coaxing me by saying, what about the French for Road to Hell? <laughs> and I said, well, she said, that'd look good on the Rue d'Enfer, you know. And it's gone in, in there for history now, it's forever. Um, he also, I've got a, a fax of one of the high boys at one is saying, wrote the hell over my dead body. He's still alive. Um, yeah, they didn't want me to do it at all. They wanted ten fools. Ten fool if you think it's over. And we even made the next album prior to bringing out Road to Hell, because I wouldn't let go, and then I'd become very aggressive in defence. And... They were going to give it half a try. If it didn't work, it would the album wouldn't come out. Because um, it all depended on your singles, you know. And Steve Wright, to our utter astonishment, played the entire bit of the beginning with before the drums come in, the gospel spiritual bit. And two weeks later, I had my first number one. Never expected it at all in any way whatsoever. That's it. Referring to creativity, you called it a condition. Mm. Because I see that um, you paint, you dream up movies, you write music, a lot of music. You put out a lot of 
albums and in the modern day when you're kind of unleashed from the rec company yoke and you can put out what you what you want you put out albums that have got 11 albums in them i mean that that extraordinary blues collection that you you put out so you're 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 making a heck of a lot of music and other stuff so talk just t tell me what this condition is you always need to be creating something yeah um without sort of getting boringly psychotic about it it is a problem that you don't want to think about the reality you know it i could say all sorts of glamorous things i walk beaches on the morning and la 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 it's not it's and especially with the illnesses you start to think too deeply about the classic what's it all about you know so to keep yourself from that because if you went there you might come back um you paint you write i've i've written nine plays tv plays um there isn't one moment even as the family holiday is like 5 minutes away before you go to Heathrow i'm just doing something and then holiday spent like that that's why i started writing plays because then i could write plays while we were on holiday and it is a condition it's a medical condition right. medical condition that produces you know beautiful songs but uh, society that's that's the product but um no it's not easy it looks fantastic and glamorous yes. and that, but it isn't um and like i say especially with the medical thing right. you cannot switch your songwriting off and so you songwriting a drama of you dying of a terrible disease you write a lot of spoiled the show no i mean i think that it's it's fascinating don't say how 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 many songs do you, how often do you write a song i've heard you say every day. It, every day every day he came to pick me up this morning and he found me over the piano there's a huge ashtray and i know it's wrong you know <laughs> and everything on the floor and i've been in there since 10 to 7 as soon as i see the news headlines i run away what was what That's was what, what was this song it. about that you're writing today um it's from our next book project um which is a complex take on Giverny the Monet's garden because i've got a side angle about what he's all about that's not it fascinates me you know i'd I'd love to have been you i'd love to have been a journalist and i would do a, an article on why something is is painted in that 1901 example and becomes a chocolate box cover but it was never a chocolate box cover when he did it and then by the time he died he had become totally lsd surreal and yet he's thought of as being some kind of soft fella you know that painted pretty flowers or something but he broke so many rules it's like my old thing about louis armstrong i always thought louis armstrong was a nice old negro with a nice cardigan who stood in front of a fire with andy williams and sang you know wonderful world and all that and then once i got into music and started buying every book you can you found out he was the down most dirty get there he was the jimmy hendrix of 1930s 40s music he wasn't the old man in the cardigan at all and i've got a take on him over that and also it's given me a musical idea about something called modal music i mean you're perfectly at liberty to say i know you are a hit and now you've gone up your own ass <laughs> it's, it may be true you know what but I've never done modal music before and I got into that when I was in hospital because you get addicted to morphine when you're on morphine for 9 weeks some guys with with, with the, the operation I had didn't survive because they never got off the morphine and you don't eat and you wither away all you want is the next morphine i mean we used to put one under the pillow because they tried to 
miss one so that you knew they were going to make it pay like this about two o'clock in the afternoon so you'd keep the first one you'd only put a little bit in they'd let you put it in because I now have to learn to inject I inject nine times a day and you became a junkie and I started reading this book by Willie Russell who discovered the modal thing that Bill Evans and Miles Davis got into and I've gone I just adore it you know, because it's a new world for me and it keeps, it keeps the news from the door. Hi, I'm Neil McCormick, and you're watching Needle Time with my guest, Chris Rea. And we are in Abbey Road, uh, where they don't normally let cameras in, but they let them in for you. No, they let you... you <laughs> You're actually getting away with it. That's the only way I can put it. So you've got your paintings here. This is. Did you record La Passione at Abbey Road? Some of the string sessions, uh, string overdubs were done here, and some of the bi the big ones were done in Number One. This is Studio Two. Yeah. Where uh, a few things have been recorded here. All the Beatles, Pink Floyd, um, Cliff Richard. Yes, you took when me he, into when he was good. <laughs> Tell us about that little, uh, there's a little room back right there which is like a, about the size of a toilet, or a lot, no, it's like the size of a large toilet, it looks like a large toilet, what, yeah. what happened in that room? Well, I went out there for a cigarette and I found it and I suddenly realised what it was. In the early days there was no reverb units to buy, there were no digital packages, there wasn't even any analogue ones. So they had to literally invent echo in the air. So they used to have a tiled room and they'd put either the amp and the, the mic in or sometimes just run a track through it, through a speaker and back up to there. And I suddenly realized what it was. And I burst into tears. You know, I thought, hang on a second, it's not breakdown time, I mean, why am I? I was just almost sobbing, you know. And it's because I remember listening. My, my elder sister brought in a Cliff Richard record, and I always used to do B-sides. And he had this song called A Voice in the Wilderness, you know, because all your Irish Catholic crap is coming out with, you know, this crisp, this, this lyric, you know. And there was this guitar that sounded like it was coming across the lake at Montreux or something. It was just the most wonderful sound. And I'm stood there looking down a back alley in Ayrson Street in Middlesbrough. And I'm thinking of the connection between the little boy there and that's finding out where that sound came from. I often wondered where that sound came from. It came from that little room out there. You recorded strings. The, one of the things about the music of La Passion, if you know anybody who doesn't know it, it's it's really luscious and romantic music. It's almost it, 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 a more Frank Sinatra type of beer, and you sing it really Careful. beautifully. Careful. <laughs> I just one song there from '96. I can't sing anymore. My voice won't go up there. Won't reach. Um, too much anaesthetic, I think. But um, I love all that stuff. You know, it's whether it's this thing about fashion which I've always struggled with that. Although I like fashion as an art, you know, I love looking at collections and I love Chanel as, as a woman, as a designer, but um, fashion and music, sometimes, it's funny now when, you, when you're watching stuff on the telly now, there are things there that are called icons and yet you and I remember being extremely embarrassed about ABBA. You know, you wouldn't walk down the street or want to do an article on ABBA, and neither would I. And yet now we're saying, it's iconic, it's genius, it's brilliant. Did they know what they were doing? And I think that's the same about the big... You see, when I think of orchestras, I think of ne Nelson Riddle, uh, Count Basie, Ellington. I mean, driving home for Christmas is actually me and Max Middleton doing a Nelson Riddle. That's what it was about. It was never, it never came out as a single um, because we didn't see it that way. We saw it as, 
what would Nelson Riddle do, you know? And that's why you have all these fabulous passes, really luscious, you know, which you can't get off synthesizer. Because you, 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 you talk about not learning the scales and that way that, that, that kind of impassioned and, and way that a kid just practices and practices and practices. Mm -hmm. But you're lead playing, you know, you're, fa you're a famous guitarist. You have a, a style, you did a blues, uh, big box of yeah. blues in which you sort of essayed every different style of the blues. That, that was just joy, it was just fun. You know, each, we did it, we did 12 CDs in one year. Every month was a different era and a different studio. And we had to have the right mics, the right amplifiers. You're all constantly on the phone, people like Andy Weff, Featherwell, Low, you know, and saying to him, Andy, have you got a so-and-so amp, you know, and have you got a little Supra from Chicago? Because we actually just wanted to be there, you know, to pretend it was 1954 or whatever. Um, I never was, people say, God, that was hard work, and it never was. It was what I wanted to do, and I got out of bed. Um, there's a certain kind of slide plane that I'm not bad at, um, and it's just come under from me. It's not like the only trouble I have with the blues is some of my older friends in the music business who go, "That's not blues," because it's not coming out of jukebox and it's not. I said, well, everyone has the blues. I mean, Bill Wyman just did not like Latin blues. He said, and I said, well, Bill, you can be, you can be in Cuba and have the blues just as much as Chicago, you know. But also, I know my limits, and apart from that, songwriting-wise, I'm not Chicago. That was a hard one. Um, I'm gospel blues, and the style of slide you play with gospel blues and what you're singing about is completely different to Chicago. Chicago's up there in your face. I'm gonna get my woman tonight, or I lost my woman tonight, and I'm really hacked off, for want of a better phrase. Whereas gospel, uh, gospel blues is far more sad, <laughs> melancholy, and it's also got some notes in that are European scale. Do, do you practice? No, I play all the time, but I don't, I've given up. I mean, I, there's no way I'll ever be Eric Clapton. <laughs> so what's the point in trying? I'd love to have learned how to play the trumpet, but you look at how many years you've got left in your life and when you'll be able to play it properly, and you think, well, I might need to be around by then, so you don't bother. And I had the, we both, Sylvan Mark, the jazz bass player, we were on tour and we both bought training pieces. And it was just shock horror because I hear Miles Davis and he goes, bap, ba, just two notes, bap, ba. And you go like this when you hear it. But the reality is, <coughs> And I thought, I can't do this, you know. And I romantically thought, I'll wander around the garden, you know. But, <laughs> no, the reality is like a huge frog or something, and, and it hurts your lips. I think, you've, uh, I think you've got enough strings on that bow, so we, we look forward to hearing your modal music and your... And the next Chris Rea one. And the next Chris Rea one. Uh, in the Which will be blues. Will be blues, yeah. yeah. Well. We'll, we'll get some more blues from here. Won't be Chicago. <laughs> I hope there's plenty more to come. Thank you for coming. Thanks for an intelligent interview. That's Chris Reed.